Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for sharing some time over lunch to listen to my talk. Um, so I've been allotted uh, 10 to 15 minutes, so this is going to be uh, fairly condensed. But I thought I'd share with you, so I head up uh, Endeavor's operations in Asia, and we've been on a, uh, basically an expansion uh, push here in Southeast Asia. We have offices currently in Indonesia, Malaysia, and opening this, uh, this next quarter in the Philippines. Um, and I thought it would be interesting for all of you to know, of course, Silicon Valley is the most famous entrepreneurial hub in the world, but I don't know if many of you actually know the full story of how Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley. Um, if you look at the most successful entrepreneurial ecosystems in the world today, Silicon Valley, of course, Tel Aviv, Los Angeles, London, Sao Paulo, um, those ecosystems were created actually by a handful of entrepreneurs. Um, and I think that message actually has uh, something important, that there's very, something very important in that message for ASEAN and how we can develop uh, the ecosystems here. Um, so I'd like to share with you some of those stories, starting first with Silicon Valley. And the story begins actually with a gentleman named William Shockley. So he was born in 1910 in London, um, two American parents, and they moved shortly after he was born back to the U.S., back to Palo Alto, California, uh, where he grew up. Uh, he lived and worked in California until he decided to get his Ph.D. at MIT uh, in physics. And so he moved to Boston. After getting his Ph.D., he had various jobs and then took a position in a research lab with um, AT&T, so Bell Labs. There, together with two colleagues, uh, they did work on the um, semiconductor technology and developed the transistor, which is obviously, uh, as, you, as you guys know, um, something that helps control and amplify electronic signals. So their groundbreaking work in transistors actually won them the Nobel Prize. Uh, but William Shockley was a very difficult person, uh, apparently, to work with, and he left, he left Bell Labs uh, basically to try to make it on his own, to try to actually commercialize the technology that he had developed, the transistor, and so um, he went back to California. He moved uh, back home to a small town, Mountain View, California, population of 6,500 in 1950. Um, and historians say that maybe one of the reasons why he moved back there to start his company was partly because his mother's health was, falling, uh, was failing, and so he decided to be, be there to be supportive with her. Um, some of you may know Mountain View uh, better by its current name, which is Silicon Valley. So the San Francisco Bay Area was a very unlikely place to actually start this new semiconductor company. Um, you can see from this list here that the uh, list of transistor companies in the US at the time, uh, New York ranked higher. In fact, other cities in California ranked higher. San Francisco area is nowhere along this list. In addition, the three things that basically um, he needed in the 1950s in order to create a successful company, which was customers, employees and financing were in very short supply. So in the mid-1950s, there was no venture capital in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and in terms of talent, at that time, Stanford graduated only 20 uh, PhDs in their engineering program. So Stanford actually had no influence on the start of Silicon Valley. He basically leveraged the fact that he was a Nobel Prize winner, not an insubstantial thing, to basically get financing from outside the San Francisco area, and then also attract eight very talented um, researchers and engineers to join him in his company. And he named the comp company Shockley Semiconductors. Now, William Shockley was a genius, but he turned out to be a very difficult boss to work with. Um, there are stories where at one time he, he had issues of paranoia, had all of his staff actually take a polygraph test. So 
Within one year of setting up Shockley Semiconductors, all eight of his researchers, his top research scientists, left at the same time. And they left at the same time and started their own company called Fairchild Semiconductors. Now, they didn't start this right away. It took them actually probably at least a year or more to get the financing necessary. They were, he, they were financed by William Fairchild, hence the name. Fairchild Semiconductors went on to become one of the most successful semiconductor uh, firms in the globe. Within three years, remember, this is still the 1950s. Within three years, they had revenues of $20 million. And by the mid-1960s, about 10 years out, they were generating revenues of $90 million, and they became the second uh, most successful uh, semiconductor company at the time. Now, actually, the extraordinary thing in this story is not the success of Fairchild Semiconductor, but it's what happened after. All eight of these co-founders left over a period of time, not at the same time, but over a period of time, left to start other companies or to fund and mentor other companies. Uh, two of the co-founders um, went on to start Intel, uh, you know, microprocess uh, microprocessor that makes obviously computers smaller and faster. Eugene Kleiner went on to start Kleiner Perkins, which um, with the backing of his co-founders, and you know, Kleiner eventually uh, replaced government agencies as well as uh, NASA to become the primary financier of technologies in the Valley. Uh, a, the top uh, marketing executive at Fairchild Semiconductors later left to work at Intel. He made good money at both firms, left, met two guys who had started a partnership. These two guys, uh, the company was called Apple wrote them a check for $250,000 and became their third employee and their first CEO. Um, an executive that was recruited by Intel uh, later went to join Kleiner Perkins. And at Kleiner, he also met a couple of entrepreneurs and at the end of the day, wrote them a $1 million check and that company was Google. So, those individuals, as well as a few others, basically make up what we call the Fairchild Mafia. And essentially, it's a group of people that collectively, you can see here, in, in the course of 12 years, created 31 different spin-offs. What's incredible to find out, actually, is that if you look at all the publicly traded companies today, 130 of them are Silicon Valley-based companies. Uh, these are publicly traded in, on the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Now, 70% of them actually trace their origins back to the Fairchild Mafia. Collectively, and this is counting just publicly listed companies because there are also a great deal, I would say in the thousands, of private companies that also trace their origins back. But if you just aggregate the value of the publicly traded companies, it's $2.1 trillion, uh, 800,000 jobs, $2.1 trillion. That is more than the annual GDP of India, Spain, uh, or Canada. Now, the Fairchild Mafia is not the only mafia that, uh, that's appeared in Silicon Valley. There's, you may have heard of the PayPal Mafia. So after PayPal was acquired by eBay, uh, many of the founders, over, again, over a period of time, left the company to start other uh, organizations. Um, and some of the most famous, you probably would have heard, uh, Tesla, LinkedIn, Sequoia Capital, and Yelp. Now what makes these entrepreneurs, these are some of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world, but what makes them very unique is, I believe they have a different definition of success. They define success not by the size of their firm, but by the size of their influence, by their networks, by their mafia. And the question is, are these dynamics exclusive to Silicon Valley? So we actually did a study. Uh, we went very far from Silicon Valley. We went to Buenos Aires, Argentina, 
which is the location of Endeavor's first operations, to actually see whether the, dy the dynamics that we see in Silicon Valley are the same in other markets. So if you look at public policy alone and macroeconomics, um, Buenos Aires, Argentina does not deserve the successful entrepreneurial ecosystem that it has. It suffered from economic crises over and over again in the last couple of decades, and it's listed as the third most corrupt country in South America. So it doesn't deserve this thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we tried to probe what happened. We basically did a survey, uh, and we got 200 respondents. We did a survey among the entrepreneurial com community. Uh, the 200 respondents, we essentially asked them to trace back their origins. We asked three simple questions. Who was your source of inspiration? Who was your early mentor? And who was your investor, if you had any? So we plotted the results on this chart. And this shows the results of the survey just as of 1996. You can see that in 1996, the ecosystem was non-existent. There are maybe about 15 IT companies, um, and they barely know each other. Now, the size of the circle represents their influence. So the bigger the uh, dark circle, the more outgoing influence they have, whether as a mentor or as an investor. This is the map as of 1999, 2006, and then 2011 when we conducted the survey. You can see that the networks are extraordinarily dense. The very, the, actually the very interesting thing here is that if you take the top four largest and most influential companies, they actually touch over 80% of the entrepreneurs in their network. It's the same dynamic that you see in Silicon Valley. So we got pretty excited about the results and we replicated the study in other countries where Endeavor operates. Uh, we took a look at Amman, Jordan, same results. Uh, Istanbul, Turkey, same results. Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Bogota, same results. So how does this pertain to ASEAN? I've been traveling, I've, I, I'm currently based in Singapore, but I've been traveling to the region for the last six or seven years, and uh, you know, based on simple observation, you can see a tremendous uptick in entrepreneurial activity, particularly in the last five years. But the question is, is it sustainable? That increase in entrepreneurial activity obviously has been fueled by a very healthy growth in economies and by heavy government subsidies in some of those economies. But without an entrepreneurial mafia in each of those countries or in the region, will the next economic crisis make this ecosystem collapse? Um, the, th the feedback that I hear from a lot of entrepreneurs uh, you know, at the SME stage and the startup stage is that it, they find it very difficult to scale. They say they have very few role models, investors or mentors to actually help them get from above the, uh, the small size. So what's the solution to this? I would actually, here at this gathering, urge all the entrepreneurs and business leaders here to actually redefine what they, redefine what they consider success. Again, not just about the success of one's own company or one's own personal success, but actually consider success to be the growth of one, one's influence and one's network, the success of one's industry, one's community, one's country, and of the whole region. And I think when people begin to think, again, beyond their narrow interests, I think we can actually help these SMEs who are interested in scaling across regions. And I think these high potential SMEs that scale across the regions can actually really meaningful, meaningfully facilitate greater SME integration and greater integration in ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks for sharing your perspectives and